So I'm continuing on with my, with my series. I will do a small series on the fundamental doctrines of the faith. You know, we've done salvation, the King James Bible, uh, soul winning, baptism. And tonight I'm going to cover a topic of prayer. It's a, it's a, you know, a pretty basic, fundamental topic, but I want to help you understand how you can have a very successful prayer life. There's a lot of people, I think, you know, there's a lot of people that pray today. I mean, people, almost everybody prays to one level or another, whether even, you know, saved, unsaved, everything. A huge amount of people will say that they pray, right? But not everyone's very successful with the prayer. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And I'll tell you why. You know, you talk, first of all, you know, a lot of people are unsaved. You know, we know God's not even hearing their prayers. He's not, you know, if they're praying to get saved, God's going to hear that prayer. But just in general, when you're unsaved, you know, God's not hearing those prayers. And, and I don't have the scripture reference right now to back that up, but, um, but, but it is in there, believe me. No, I, was <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't even going to get into that tonight. But um, we're in Matthew chapter 7, and this, this is a great passage. Look at what it says in verse number 7. This is, this is really, really, really assuring for us. We know that we have a God in heaven, a Father that loves us. And that is willing to hear us. And look what it says in verse number 7 of Matthew 7. He says, ask. Now that word, the word pray, like to pray, it literally just means to ask. That's what you're doing when you're praying for something. You are asking. And I just want to make this dis distinction before we go any further in the chapter. Oftentimes, like today, we had food after the service. And, you know, we, we gave a blessing and we asked God's blessing on the food, but it's not necessarily a prayer. So, like, every time I sit down to eat, I'm not necessarily always praying to God because praying, you're praying for God, you're asking for something. But when you just, you give thanks for the food and say, God, thank you for this food that you've given us today, you know, and everything, giving thanks, it's not necessarily the same thing as praying. But praying is just literally the same thing as asking. So when we pray to God, we're asking for something, whether it be for ourselves or for something else. We are, we are making a request known unto God. Say, God, we want this to happen in our lives or in someone else's lives. That's what a prayer is. So he says in verse number seven, ask and it shall be given you. What a great promise, huh? He says, look, just ask. Ask God. Ask and it shall be given, uh, given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now my first point I want to make is you can't expect to receive anything from God unless you ask. There's a lot of things that are going on in your life. And, and this is tied in real closely. This morning I was preaching on fasting. Of course, fasting and prayer. I'm not going to cover fasting tonight, although it is a, a very good aspect of, of prayer. If you, want, if you want to be heard by God and you want to increase you know, your, your, your likelihood of God just totally listening to you, you, you know, when you go all out and you fast and you pray unto God, and get his attention, you humble yourself. That is a great way to get your prayers answered. But we see, even in the text right here, it says, everyone that asketh receiveth. But we need to be able to go to him and ask for things. We need to, to think about doing that. You know, oftentimes, especially men, you know, are like this a lot, where, you know, you have a problem, something's going on, you don't like asking people for help. You just want to do it yourself. You want to get things done. You know, no, I could, I, could, I could go through this. And you don't ask people to help you out. You're just like, no, I'm going to do this. And, and you just keep on going with it. Well, that's not necessarily a wise thing to do. And oftentimes, the only reason why, why we get like that is, is really just because of our pride. I mean, you just want to feel like you do it yourself. I don't need anybody's help. Well, with, with some of the little things in life, okay, it's not that big of a deal, Right? I mean, you're changing a tire on a car or something. Ah, no, 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 I could do this. I could take care of it myself. But you got other problems in your life. Don't feel like you have to tackle everything all by yourself. You know, God wants to hear from you. And anyone that has children understands this. When your children ask you to help, I mean, you know, part, a lot, part of me loves hearing that. I love to hear my children asking me for help with something. I really do. You know, some people might get irritated at, but I love when they go, Daddy, can you, can you help me with this? Can you fix this for me? And I love to do things for them. And, and you know, as a father in heaven, loving father, as born again Christians, as children of God, God is telling us, hey, he wants to hear from us. He's saying, ask and you'll receive. 
Now, if my children have something, a problem that they have, and you know, in their lives, their problems aren't that big. So, like, they have a toy that's broken, you know, the head's popped off of, of one of their dolls or whatever. If they don't ask me to fix it, I'm not just going to go and fix it. I probably won't, you know, like me, I'm humanly speaking, you know, I'm not even going to know about it. But if they come to me and ask me, guess what? They're going to receive, right? Now, it doesn't always come at the moment that they want it to happen, right? I don't always just drop everything I'm doing and be like, okay, let me fix this doll for you. <laughs> but it does get done. You know, it, it may take a week or it may take a month. But, <laughs> but, but, but it does happen, right? And, and, and I will answer those requests, those prayers that they have to me. And it's the same way with God, okay? He's saying, look, everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and him that knocketh it shall be opened. He wants us to have joy. He wants, to, he wants us to live good lives, and he wants to be there to help us out. And he also wants us reliant on him. If you remember that from this morning, you know, we're talking about being proud and being able to just humiliate ourselves, humble ourselves, and be able to rely on God for everything that we need and go to him for everything. He says in verse 9, and this is what he likens it to, is a person having children, a man having children. Or what man is there among you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? He's like, if your child comes to you and asks you for food, like, hey, Dad, I'm hungry. Are you just going to give him like a, a, a rattlesnake? <laughs> You're like, here you go, kid. Like, of course not. It's ridiculous. Are you saying that? It's ridiculous. Of course, no father is going to do that to his son. And he says, look, if ye then, being evil, because we are, I mean, the Bible says there's none good, no, not one. There's none that doeth good and sinneth not. We all fall, come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. We're evil. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? He's saying, you know how to give good gifts. You're not perfect. You're not God. You're not sinless. You know, God is, is holy. God is perfect. And if you're able to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will God give unto you? But you have to go to him and ask. And that's what he says. Now, here's another point. Look at verse number 12 because it almost seems like it, it has nothing to do with it. But look at that first word of verse 12. He says, therefore. What does therefore mean? For this reason. We just got done. Verses 7 through 11, we're all talking about asking God, you know, and, and giving good gifts and God giving things to them that asks. But look at verse number 12. This will help you in your prayer life to God when you go to God and ask Him for things. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You say, yeah, I've heard that before. It's basically you know, the golden rule, right? The way that you want people to treat you is the way that you should treat them. God ties this in with prayer, with asking Him for things. See, if you're this jerk that thinks everyone should be doing things for you and you're not going to do anything for anyone else, and when people come to you with a problem, you're not willing to help them out, and when people, you know, and you treat people poorly and stuff like that, God's going to see that happening. And when you all of a sudden now go to God with a problem, He's going to be like, I saw the way that you deal with people. Now you expect to just get help from me? No, I'm not going to help you. This, 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 is, this is delves into to God's personality and how God, how God reacts. That's why that word, therefore, is, is there to begin with at all. Because he's relating it to the prayer. He's saying, look, hey, all you got to do, ask God. But keep this in mind. Whatsoever ye would, would just means what you want, right? Whatsoever you would want that men should do to you, how you want to be treated, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. That, that, this, that will improve your prayer life tremendously when you can have this attitude of, of being able to, to treat other people just exactly. You know, it's, it's not that profound. Hey, how would I like someone to treat me in this situation? Do that to everybody else all the time. You have that type of an attitude, guess what? God's going to have a very open ear under the things that you ask for. Oftentimes, you might have somebody that asks you to help them out with something, and it's a major inconvenience for you, right? But you put yourself in their shoes and say, well, what if I was in this situation? You know, you have a friend or not even necessarily a friend, just an acquaintance, right? Someone who's not even a good friend of yours. Because it's a lot easier to do nice things for your friends, right? I have some really good friends. I love my friends. And they're there for me and I'm there for them. And they know that and, you know, and I know that. And, and I have some really good friends that will drop anything that they're doing and come and help me out if I needed to be. And I would do the same thing for them. 
But think about people that maybe aren't even your friends. Right? But they're in, they're in a tough spot and they really need some help. If you have the attitude of to say, well, hey, if I was in this position, I've got no one to help me and I asked this person to help me out, wouldn't I really appreciate it if they would come and, and give me a hand and help me out with this thing? And this is the type of attitude that we need to have. And he says, look, when you act like that, God, you know, no one else has to see that happen. It's not to be done to, to, to prove to other people what a great guy you are or how, how loving and caring you are for other people. Look, it doesn't matter. You know, hopefully nobody knows about that and sees that because it doesn't matter. It's not to be seen of men, but God sees all things. And when God sees your heart and when God sees you helping people like that, and then all of a sudden you come into need, you don't even have to worry about other people doing the same thing for you because God will help you. God will make sure it happens. Turn, if you would, to uh, Matthew chapter 21. You're in, you're in chapter 7. Turn to chapter 21. I'll just read for you from John 4. We went over this last week. There's um, the story of the, of the woman at the well. Um, you know, in, in, in Matthew 7, we saw, Ask and it shall be given unto you. The, the best thing that a person could ask for is salvation, is just to be saved. Uh, with the woman at the well, he said, Jesus said unto her, He said, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. He said, if you, would, if you know what I actually have, you'd be asking me for some water. Because remember, Jesus asked her for water. Jesus said, hey, you know, give me to drink. And he was asking her for water. And, and then he explains to her later on, he's like, look, if you knew the gift of God, and he's talking about eternal life, if you know that, that who you're talking to, that I'm the Christ, and that I have living water, you would be asking me for that gift. And he, and he says, and you'd get it. I'd give it to you. And Christ is, you know, God is, is willing and ready to hear that one very prayer. And, and this is one prayer that's regardless of how you treat other people. That one prayer asking God for eternal life, he will hear that prayer from anybody and he will give it no matter what. Okay, that's, that is, that is a, a, a distinction of one thing that you can ask for. You know, I'm trying to help you out with your prayer life tonight, but it's, it's, it's preaching to people who are already saved, right? You're all, you already have that free gift. So if I'm going to help you with your prayer life, we're going to look into a little bit more of the details of these things about where he's saying, ask and you shall receive, and see that we need to be making sure that we are living a certain way in order for God to fully be listening to us and hearing our prayers. But that one thing that a person could ask for about salvation, his ear is open for that prayer all the time. And it's not based on how well you're living. It's not based on how good you're doing to other people. He is just waiting for you to ask him for that gift of eternal life. And he's, he's there and ready to give it out at a moment's notice at any time. But you're in Matthew chapter 21. Another thing that's going to help you to receive what you're asking for is not to limit God even in your mind or in your thoughts or in your perceptions. When you ask God for something... Don't be doubtful in your mind about, oh, well, you know, like we had, we had a, a, you know, a prayer request a couple weeks ago for a, a young boy, a 12-year-old that had, had brain tumors and stuff. Look, it could be a really hopeless-looking situation. But when we pray, we ought not to be doubtful about it and thinking that, well, God's not going to do this. And just have this negative attitude. Well, I guess I'll pray anyways. Look, that is not the proper attitude to have. Look at Matthew 21, verse 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not. He's saying, Don't doubt me. Don't, you know, if you have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this, which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. So when you go to God in prayer, it's important that you believe that he is capable of doing these things that you're asking him for. That you're not just doing it as like, well, I guess it's something I should do. But as a, no, God is all powerful. God is able to do anything. He says, look, you could, you could say, God, remove this mountain. An entire mountain. Move and cast it in the sea. He says, it'll be done. If you, have, you, know, if you, if you go to him in faith and ask for these things, he's, don't doubt 
Nothing is too big for God. That's a point he's trying to get across. No matter what your obstacle is, no matter what the problem is that you're facing, nothing is too big for God. A boy, a 12-year-old boy with brain tumors, hey, that's not too big for God. God is capable of healing that child. When none of the doctors in the world can, God is capable of doing things. But we need to go to him in faith and trust and know, believing that he can do these things. Turn, if you would, to the book of James, chapter number 1. James chapter 1. I'll read for you from John 14. John 14, 13 says, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. God's looking to be glorified. God loves when, when he's able to step in and do the, the supernatural for things where no, you know, man's not able to do it. And, um, and you go to him in prayer, and, and he listens, and he will do those things. Look at James chapter 1. Verse number 5 of James chapter 1. The Bible reads, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. He's saying, look, if you need some wisdom, if you're not, if you're not that smart, if you want to know a little bit more wisdom from the Bible, Hey, go to God. And this is a good habit to get into. You know, when, when, you read your, when you go to read your Bible, pray that God will open up your understanding and grant you that wisdom because this is something that God is guaranteed to answer because it's definitely in His will that you have more wisdom. God wants that to happen. You know, and I'll get into this a little bit earlier, a little bit later, but not every prayer that you pray is, is, is God just going to give you. See, because even though Jesus Christ said, look, ask and you shall receive, as we get more in depth and, and see more details about praying to God, God's not just your genie in a lamp, right? God's not there to do your bidding where you can just, just rub the lamp and be like, God, I want a million dollars right now. And he just, boom, you got it. That's not God, okay? That's, that's, that's a, a fake. That's a fraud. And that's not what Jesus is saying here. He says, ask and you shall receive, because there's a lot of other aspects that go into this. Part of it is, as we saw in Matthew 7, hey, how are you treating other people? Is how well God's going to be listening to you, okay? But look at what he says. He says, you know, this we know is, is according to God's will. God wants you to be smarter. God wants you to be wise. God wants you to know his words. Ask of God, it says that give it to all men liberally. Now, I know a lot of people like, like the word liberals. It's like a negative word. It's a bad word. You know, all those liberals. Look, the word liberal just means like freely. Okay? So what he's saying here is that if you lack wisdom, ask God and he'll give that to you freely, like just as much as possible. He'll pour out the wisdom unto you. He's not going to spare and hold back and just be like, well, here's a little bit for you. No. He says, I'll give you, I'll give you all the wisdom that you need. And it shall be given him. Look at verse 6. It says, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He's saying, if you, if you just waver on stuff, and you go to God and you ask him, like, well, I'm not really sure if he's going to answer my prayer. And you're just kind of wishy-washy and you're, just, you're being kind of tossed about. God's not going to answer your prayer. He says, think not that, uh, that he's gonna, he shall receive anything of the Lord. You need to be confident when you, when you go to God. Confident that he could, he's going to answer your prayer. Confident that you're asking for the right thing. Confident that you go to God just say, hey, look, I need wisdom, Lord. No one's like, ah, I don't know if he's going to give it to me. I'm really not that smart. I don't know. If he, look, he will. I mean, his word says so anyways. But we need to make sure that we're not wavering, that we go to him completely in faith, trusting and believing that, that he is a God and he is capable and he is there, he's real, he exists, and he wants to answer your prayers. You're in James. Flip over to 1 John chapter 3. It's not that far from the book of James. 1 John chapter 3. Because we're talking about not wavering when we go to God. Oftentimes you might waver when you go to God as a result of sins in your life. 
because you're going to be a little bit uneasy. You know, you have sin in your life, you're going to be uneasy going, uh, yeah, I just was doing all this stuff, but I need something from God now. You know, you're going to be like, you know, wavering that way. We, but we don't want to waver because when you waver, he says, you know, he's not going to answer your prayers. We already know that. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 21. The Bible reads, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. So when our heart is not condemning us because, you know, we're keeping ourselves free from, from sin, our, hey, you get convicted on your own when you get into sin, right? You know, you know when you've done wrong. But when your heart is not condemning you, that's when you have a lot more boldness and a lot more confidence towards God. Verse 22, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Great way to, to help your prayer life is do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Keep his commandments. They are important. People say, you know, we get this thing all the time. Oh, yeah, if you easy believism people, like, well, well, why would you even follow God's laws? Why would you even follow his commandments? I mean, you're saved anyway, so who cares, right? Why don't you just go out and keep sinning? Well, here's a good reason why now, because if we want to go to God and ask him for stuff in our life, if we're not keeping his commandments, he's not going to give it to us. We can't even have that confidence and that boldness to go to God with a clean heart, with a pure heart, and to say, God, I'm doing what you want me to do, but I'm having this trouble here. God, please help me with this. We can be a lot more bold and have that confidence of just knowing, hey, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Amen. And that's a great feeling, by the way, to just know. I mean, obviously, look, I know we're all sinners. But, but you know, people like to pick apart your words. I know we're all sinners, and I'm not saying I'm perfect, but there are times when things are going really well spiritually for you, and, you know, and, and you're, you're avoiding all kinds of sins. God's going to hear you way better when you are living your life in that way. They're not, they're not claiming perfection, and that's not what we're looking at, but when you can at least go to bed and, and have a, a, righteous, you know, a righteous mind and a, con a clear conscience that just says, you know what? I've, I've done you know, what I'm supposed to be doing. And, and you have nothing you know, haunting you and, and, and convicting you. That gives you a lot more boldness and confidence towards God. And um, that's the way that we need to be approaching God in prayer in order for him to answer our prayers. Now, flip back over to Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6. We covered this a little bit. I'm not going to go too in-depth. We covered this this morning somewhat with uh, the fasting and praying. You know, we, we talked about the hypocrites when they fast and they disfigure their face and they look, appear unto men that they're fasting so that everybody knows that they're fasting. Matthew 6 talks more about people who pray. And, you know, Matthew 6 is a lot of, a lot of um, ways not to pray. You know, for one... We don't want to pray a repetitious, vain prayer, just like chanting the same thing over and over and over again. And this is something that the Catholic Church teaches and that they do. And they'll tell you, say, you know, 30 Hail Marys and, all, you know, whatever, however many Our Fathers, and that they think that, like, you know, by praying this over and 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 over again, like you're going to get through to God or something. Like, I don't know exactly what their philosophy is on that, but Jesus Christ specifically said, don't do that. And what's really interesting is that when we look at Matthew chapter 6, this is where you see the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, right? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be. This, this whole thing, which I have memorized because I was raised in a, in a Presbyterian church, right? And we chanted that very prayer. And I remember when I was young, and I didn't really know that much, and I wanted to pray unto God. What did I do? I chanted that prayer. But it's ridiculous. We're going to read through this, and we're going to see how that is not what, <laughs> what God intended for us to do at all. And that is not a righteous way to pray. It's not what we're supposed to be doing. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to start reading in verse number 5. He says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So first of all, you know, when you pray, you don't, it's not, you know, the point of prayer is not to be seen of other people. It's not to make some eloquent oration so that everyone here can hear how well you pray and how good you are at praying. Look, if that's what you're doing it for, you have your reward already. It's not going to be what you're asking God for. 
It's going to be your, your own the adoration from, from man. But let's keep reading. Verse number 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. He said, look, the heathen do this. They chant. They use these vain repetitions over and over and over again. He said, I don't want you to do that. That's not for you. That's what the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. And that's exactly what I said. They think that, you know, people think that they just chant over and over and over again that finally it's going to get through to God. Where God's just like, you know, oh, like, fine. Oh, that's what you want? Right? Like just wearing them down with just saying the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. He says, no, you don't have to do that. That's what the heathen does. Verse number eight, be not ye therefore like unto them. For your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. He said, look, God already knows what you need. Now he wants you to ask him, but you don't need to just repeat yourself, you know, nonstop, just, just completely being repetitive. He knows. He knows before you ever even ask. He's not saying don't ask, but you don't have to be repetitive, right? Like my, my children often tell you if they were you know, dad, 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 dad. <laughs> like, I know. Okay, I, I got it. I, I already knew that your bike was broke. Yeah, let's go. I'll, I'll fix it. But <laughs> well, let, let's keep reading here. Verse number nine. He says, After this manner, therefore pray ye. And now he says, look. After this manner, this is the way in which you ought to pray. He's not saying these are the exact words that you have to use in order to pray. It's a, it's a manner. It's a, it's, a, it's a way of praying. And he starts off with, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So he starts off a prayer addressing God the Father and giving him honor and glory, just saying, you know, your name is hallowed. Your name is above all. You know, your name is great and glorious. As you're approaching God to ask him for something, it's good to just recognize how great and magnificent he is. It's a good opening to a prayer. He says, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. He's saying, you know, in, again, in the intro to his prayer, Say, God, I want your kingdom to come here. I want your will being done. This prayer that I'm praying to you, I pray that it's according to your will because I want your will to be done, not just the things that I want. Again, this is the template he's giving to us and what these words actually mean. I want your will to be done, God. And when we go to God in prayer, when we want something or need something in our life, we ought to be including that and say, God, you know, I want this, you know, this is what I think I need in my life, but you know better than me and I want this to be according to your will. So help me out with that, Lord. You know, please answer this prayer in a way that's going to be according to your will. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. That's ask, then now he's getting to the point where he's asking God for something. God, give us, you know, give me some food. Being reliant on God. God, please feed me today. I need, I need to eat. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts. Look at that, as we forgive our debtors. So, so the way that we treat other people, we saw this earlier. Please, please treat me the same way. You know, forgive me of my faults and, and my wrongs and the things that I do, the way that, that, that I treat other people. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Verse 14, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, he gave that, that prayer as an example. That's the manner in which we ought to be going to God. But it doesn't mean that you repeat those words just repetitiously over and over and over again. That, I mean, that's just silly. And if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, <laughs> if you want to ask God for something, why would you just repeat this prayer over and over again? He's saying, you know, unless, unless your prayer is always, God, just feed me today. Feed me today. You'll give us this day our daily bread. Because that's, that's like the meat of the, of the prayer right there. He's saying, don't do that. But just that, like I would treat my children, when, you know, when God sees you treating other people the way that you'd want to be treated, God's going to treat you well also. If I see my children being brats and, and, and being mean to other people, 
I'm not just going to continue that, you know, it reinforce that behavior and just be like, sure, you know, I'll give you whatever you want and turn them into more of a monster. Right? I mean, that's what the spoiled brat does. The spoiled brat that gets everything they want, they go and ask dad, you know, anything they want, they get it. And, the, you know, the parents are just like, yeah, yeah, here, shut up, kid, here, you just have more stuff. And then, like, a friend comes over and they're not, you know, they're hoarding all their stuff. And they, you know, like, they're not willing to let them play with any of their toys. And they're just, just being this, you know, kind of a, a monster of a kid. They're not, they're, not, they're not being a good child. If I were to see that as their father, I'd be like, no. Like, you're not going to get any more stuff until you learn how to, how to treat other people nicely and with respect and, um, you know, and be able to, to look and care about other people's feelings and other people's needs. And, you know, God treats us the same way. Turn, if you would, to uh, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, because you want your prayers to get answered. We need to make sure that we're praying, we're asking for the right things. I mentioned this earlier, no, God's not our genie. And he's not here just to, to be at our beck and call. But, you know, you might have prayed for something in the past and be like, well, God didn't answer that prayer. I thought the Bible says, asking you shall receive. Well, one, we need to make sure we're obeying him. We're doing, we're doing, we're treating people the way we want to be treated. We're keeping his commandments that we could go to him boldly and, and ask in confidence and not wavering, right? These are all things that could hamper our prayer life. But what about this? You know, asking according as will, like we saw in Matthew 6, that thy will be done. As in heaven, so on earth. Look at uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse number 14. The Bible reads, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So now it adds that caveat. Well, if you ask anything according to his will, he's going to hear that. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Sometimes you could ask for things and it's not according to God's will. And if God doesn't want that to be done, he's not going to give that to you. You know, I'll tell you right now, as much as God wants you to have joy in your life, it's probably not God's will that you become a billionaire. That's not going to bring you the joy anyways. Now, you might think that way. You might think all of my problems are financial. And if, and if all of this was just taken care of, then I would be the happiest guy on earth. But that's because you lack wisdom. You ought to be praying for more wisdom because God will give that to you liberally, right? Then be worried about the money. So all throughout the Bible, he says, don't worry about money. Don't worry about your treasures here on earth. That's not what life is about. It means nothing. You pray God for your daily bread. He'll take care of you. You're not going to be begging. But you don't do, you're not going to see the righteous begging bread. You're doing what's right by God. He will take care of you. He says, you don't even have to worry about that. Look at, the, look at the beasts of the field. Look at the animals. God takes care of them. They don't have to worry about hoarding everything and, and sorting all up. They don't have to stress out about it. God takes care of them. How much more is he going to take care of you? We need to ask for the right things. Turn to James chapter 4. Let's flip back to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse number 1. James 4, 1, the Bible reads, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and obtain and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. So talking about asking for the right things, right? Verse 3 says, look, you're asking. You're asking things of God, but you're not receiving it. Why are you not receiving the things you're asking for? Because you ask amiss. You're asking for the wrong thing. He's saying when you ask for things that you may consume it upon your lusts, just your, your, your fleshly lusts that you have, like wishing you had a million dollars or just, you know, asking for things that are, that are just have to do with your, with your lust, with your sin, with whatever. You're not going to get that. You know, if I, <laughs> I won't bring up an example like that. There's, there's just things, there's things that you can think of that's just like, you know, if you were to ask, ask God for something just completely ridiculous, it's like, 
Um, you know, if you, you really like drinking alcohol and you're like, God, just, just fill up my whole house with like the best booze on earth. Like, God, I'm asking for, like, like you're asking for the wrong thing. That's stupid. And, and of course you're not going to have that. You just want to consume that on your own lusts, right? So we need to ask for the right things. We need to be doing what's right. Uh, turn, if you would, to John chapter 16. I'm going to see a few, a few more things. We're almost done. It's going to be a little bit shorter sermon tonight, probably. Um, John chapter 16. I'll read for you John 15, verse 7 says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. If you're abiding in Christ, if you're, if you're, if you're doing what God wants you to do and living a righteous life, hey, you're going to be walking in the Spirit. You're going to be you know, asking for the right things already anyways, and He's going to do that for you. When you're doing right by Him, it's going to be done unto you. Look at John chapter 16. Verse number 22. Because God does want us to have joy. God wants us to be happy in his life. We, we, ought, we ought to you know, rejoice evermore, the Bible says in our, in our memory passage. Rejoice evermore. God wants us to have joy. And we have the luxury of being able to go directly to him with our requests. We don't have to go through a man. We don't have to go to a priest in order for the priest to talk to God for us and, and ask our, our petitions of him in order to go to God. We can go to God directly. The Bible says in John 16, verse 22, he says, And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. He's saying up to this point, you haven't asked God anything in, my, you know, in the name of Jesus. But he says now, he says, ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. God wants you to be happy. Jesus Christ is saying, look, God wants you to be happy. You can go to God the Father. You ask in my name, and he'll give it to you. Verse 25, These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. He's saying, God loves you. God listening to you. He's going to hear you. We don't have to go through anybody. Now, we have a tendency when we read all these verses, we read a lot of verses so far tonight, and when you think about prayers, and even what I was referencing, you know, we think about things that we want or need for ourselves. And that's pretty natural, right? I mean, we all have problems, we all have things that we go through, and normally when you think about prayer, you're thinking about yourself. But that shouldn't always be the case. When you look at the verses carefully and how they're worded, they talk about answering your prayers. But nowhere does it imply that it's referring to prayers about yourself. It's just your prayers, your requests unto God. But it's easy when you read that to automatically assume it's just talking about yourself because we have a lot of needs, right? However, who the beneficiary of those prayers are is not mentioned. We ought to be keeping others in our prayers, and that should also be something that brings you joy. You know, we ought to be, be keeping other people and be concerned about their well-being and, and, and how good they're doing. And, and that's, you know, again, we have, the, we have the prayer request to pray for other people. And hopefully that's something that does bring you the joy, that your joy can be full when God answers your prayer for somebody else. When you could see God work in their life and you say, praise the Lord. You know, we, we spent, we, I spent a lot of time praying for that person, praying that, that they'll get recovered, they'll, you know, whatever, whatever their issue is, and then you see that happen. Hey, that ought to bring you joy. Do you care enough about other people to go to God and to pray for them? Turn, if, turn if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. We're almost done. Matthew chapter 5. As I mentioned earlier, when we're talking about... Um, you know, treating other people the way you'd want to be treated, it's a, lot, it's a lot easier to do that for your friends. Well, it's also a lot easier to pray for your friends, too, because you care about them. You naturally care about them, so people that you care about, you're going to be more likely to pray for. 
But look at what the Bible says here in Matthew chapter 5. And, and of course, we should pray for our friends. You should pray for your friends and your family and yourself, the things that you have need of. All of these things are things that we ought to be praying. Now look, you start saying, well, wait a minute. If I, start, if I pray even just for myself, that's a lot of time. And then my family and friends, well, that's even more time. And look what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Verse 43 of Matthew 5. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Jesus Christ is saying here to pray for those that use you. Those aren't your friends. Those are, you know, these are people that are, that, are, that are treating you bad. And he's saying, pray for them too. I, I, I would never ask for a show of hands for this, but just think to yourself, you know, have you ever even done that before? Ever? In your life? One time prayed for someone who is not good to you and is not, you know, we need, we need to make sure we don't have this, this bad attitude of a... That person treated me bad. And you know, th that's what leads to grudges. And you know, this could even happen within a church. Okay, We ought not to be holding grudges against people that have wronged us or have wronged somebody else. Right? And you look at them and be like, oh man, yeah, that person did that. And you just hold that against them forever. If that happens... And you can pray. Look, someone that gets despitefully used. Hey, they despitefully use that. Yeah, but they, they use that person. Pray for them. Pray for them. You know what that's going to do? That's going to help you with your own bitterness to get over whatever that wrong was, whether it be to you or whether it be to somebody else. When you pray for that person, you're going to start caring for them even more. And the reason why God's telling us about this, because there's a lot of wicked lost people in this world and we need to love them. And it may be someone that's done you wrong, but hey, I mean, if they're lost, you can't just say, well, I'm never going to talk to that person. They did me wrong. No, pray for them and then love them and then try to get them saved. That's the heart that God has. And that's the heart that he wants you to have. Now, this all sounds great when it's being preached, but it's another thing to actually take this home with you and do it. Take it to that next level. Don't have the wrong attitude about people and just shut them down and, and you know, pray for them. Pray for yourself. Pray for your family. Pray for your friends. And pray for your enemies. That's a lot of prayer. And look, I I'll be honest with you, I struggle with prayer myself. It's a hard thing to do. It is hard because you need to make time for it. And the worst time to make time for it is right before you go to bed because you're never going to get through all of your prayers because you're going to end up falling asleep before you do it. Okay? But I would recommend not doing it just at one time. The way you're going to get through all your prayers is going to be to stagger it a little bit. You pray in the morning. Pray sometime in the afternoon, pray on a drive, pray at home, pray in the evening, right? These are things that we ought to do. Jesus Christ himself, in Luke 6, 12, you don't have to turn there, it said, and it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Jesus Christ was the example he thought it was important enough. I know, you know, like we're, we had a lot of stuff going on this week and, you know, sometimes we get kind of stressed out and my wife and I, and it's like, I really, I need to just get some sleep because I need to be, you know, able to do this stuff in the morning and, and it becomes just this big deal about getting sleep. But Jesus Christ said, you know, I'm going to forego that sleep and pray all night to do God's will. And, and it could be hard to do sometimes. Obviously, we need, to, we need to, we do need to have some sleep. But you know what? Losing a night's sleep sometimes because you're doing the will of the Lord, because you're praying or because you're doing something like that, we can do that. We should be able to get by with that. It's, is, is it uncomfortable? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you better bet it's uncomfortable getting a, a night of no sleep. Is it uncomfortable being homeless and not having a place to sleep? You better bet you. 
Is it uncomfortable not really knowing where you're going to lay down your head and, and where you're going to get your food from? Yeah, but you know what? Jesus Christ did all of that. He didn't have a place to lay his head. He stayed up all night in a mountain. Do you want to just go up to one of the mountains around here and just pray unto God all night? That's what Jesus did. That was his example. I'm not one saying that I've gone up into the mountain and prayed all night. <laughs> okay, but he's the example. And, and, and that is extreme. You know, you can say, well, that's, that's, that's just, just beyond anything I could ever do. Okay, well, can you at least, like, I mean, even if you stayed up all night in your house, in the warmth, in the comfort of your, of your own house, look, if, if that's what it takes to get everything prayed for, then, then, then do it, you know? It doesn't have to be done every night. I mean, God doesn't expect that of you to, to stay up every single night and just never get sleep. But sometimes you need to give a little extra push. Sometimes things just need to get done for God, the way that God wants us to live our life, whether it be, you know, getting sewing done. Sometimes that means, you know what, the work that you planned on doing around the house or the work that you're doing here, it just needs to go by the wayside for a minute because I need to go serve God. I need to make, this is more important, I need to do this. Sometimes you have a real busy day and like, no, I need, I need to read the Bible. I need to get in there. I need to hear from God. I haven't been praying. You know, I need to make sure that I pray. Jesus separated himself from everybody, from his disciples, from everyone. He went alone and prayed. And this isn't the only time that this happened either. You read through the Bible. It's not just one event, one time where Jesus prayed all night. So remember these things. You want to have a successful prayer. Prayer is important. And we know it's important. It, we, we serve a God that wants to hear from us. He loves to hear from us. He wants to answer our prayers. He's there to, to, to answer them. Ask and you shall receive. But let's ask according to his will. Let's be the type of person where God can look at us and say, you know what, yeah, I really do want to help them out. Let's pray not just for our friends, but even for people that use us. Let's have the right hearts and the right humility and the right attitude towards people. And let's spend enough time doing that. I mean, if you knew that you have God's ear, would you really even want to let that go? And just say like, eh, well, two minutes is enough. Right? God, you like, like, just think about that. You have God's attention and you're talking to God and be like, eh, I prayed for two minutes. Right? It's not something you check off. I mean, you're, you're talking to God. And hopefully he's hearing you. I mean, it, he should be. He said he's going to. If he's hearing you and, you and you know that and you're approaching him boldly, hey, you ought not to have a two-minute prayer life. We ought to be going to him with boldness. Well, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the instruction that you've given us. And I know that there's a lot more content about this subject in the Bible, dear Lord. You, you definitely want to hear from us and you've, you've told us that. God, I pray that you would please help us to become better in our prayer life and to, to take something from tonight and apply it in our own lives, dear Lord. It's not always easy. And again, Lord, I, personally, I struggle with this myself. I pray that you would please help me to have the right attitude and to have the right heart and to be able to, to come to you and, and make the time necessary to just to, to pray unto you and to ask you for these things, dear Lord, both the things in my life that I need and in the lives of others around me, dear Lord. And, and everyone in this room, I'm sure, would share that same prayer tonight, dear God. Help us and, and, and stir up our souls, stir up our spirits, and help us to, to make the changes necessary in order to make prayer a priority in our life, dear Lords. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.